Good evening, LCM. Tonight's Thursday, June 30th. We're going to start this message off with a question for you tonight. When I say the word Phillips, what does that mean to you? Come on, somebody answer. Okay. Yes. We got wedding. We got Keith. We got Rhett. We, we got, we got screw. You see that? Yeah. See, I'm a mechanic, guys. Uh, it's hard for me to get away from that word screwdriver. That's what it is. That's what it means to me. But either way that you think about this word, we are rejoicing over the upcoming wedding and union of Mr. Phillips over here. Less than two days away. And that word is going to become a reality. We are so excited for you, brother. See, one of my favorite parts of the whole day is going to be watching Mr. Phillips watch his bride walk down the aisle. Oh, my goodness. Brother, we cannot wait to rejoice and celebrate with you in that glorious day. Just about 42 hours away, 40 hours. Oh, my goodness. We're getting so close. Man, there's going to be no fear inside of you, Brother Rhett. There's going to be no shame inside of you, Brother Rhett. You're going to take a plunge into a brand new area of exploration and fulfillment, my brother. You got all the tools that you need for success, brother. You got what you need. Can't wait to see you get your bride. Come on. Man, we are excited for what the Lord is doing in this house and each and every family. We've been learning some simply amazing things about the word Shechem here recently. And yes, we're talking about the city and the body part. That's true. But for our pur purposes tonight, as we begin our message, let's take a look at this slide from Sunday. So Shechem, Shechem. the shoulder, the upper back, drop down to the bold underlined statement there. To carry the government on one's shoulders is to bear the burden of rulership. It's a yoke. It's sharing in a common effort or open consent to something. Guys, this word Shechem means shoulder. It is what we are bearing on our back. It refers to the entire upper back right. and neck area. I'm not, I'm not as wide as this guy is, but... Right here. All this area. So when you consider that Shechem is right in between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, the mountain of transformation and the mountain of blessing... You can see how Shechem could mean the entire area across the, your back that spans the difference between these two areas. Mount Ebal is about the, an altar so that curses could be rightly dealt with by having sin atoned for. Guys, have we been bringing what we need to to that altar and having sin atoned for? Yeah. As we are doing that joyfully. Mount Gerizim is about the blessing that comes from a life filled with obedience and it's a trust-grounded obedience. Can, are we receiving that blessing in this place? Yeah. God is showing us where we must take steps of obedience. And it's a beautiful journey that he's taken us on. Shechem is about the place designated by God for real men and women. Do we have some real men and women in this place? Yeah. Oh, yes. Guys, this is where we get to encamp. This is where we inhabit and live so that we can participate in the amazing blessings that are present on both mountains. You know what, brother? This whole shoulder concept, everything that we've learned about Shechem up to this point, it's not mutually exclusive, though. No, in fact, learning to live between these two mountains, it is completely contingent upon learning to live in unity with one another. You cannot separate unity with us dwelling in Shechem. Those two concepts go together completely. You can't separate them out. You cannot properly learn to live in Shechem without learning to lean your shoulder into the shoulders of your brother. It can't happen. Zephaniah 3.9 is evidence of this fact. For at that time, I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech. That all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord, the ESV says. 
Man, we have a slide for you on this that is going to blow your mind. So Zephaniah 3, 9, it says, broken down here, Then will I turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord, to serve with him one consent. So the words there are Shechem, a masculine noun referring to a shoulder, the upper back, and Ichad, a numerical adjective meaning one, first, once, and the same. So one of the primary goals of everything that we've been preaching to you about for these last couple of weeks is for us to deepen our ability to live together under Shechem Ichad, one shoulder. The Lord our God is Ichad. And that means that our goal is to continually be transformed so that more and more we are calling upon the name of the Lord and learning how to serve him Shechem Ichad. The Lord is bringing us into unity to serve him with one shoulder, with one purpose. Guys, this is so important because our ultimate goal together is transformation. Yep. Okay? We're just going to put that right out there for everybody to know. Transformation in every single one of us is your pastors and elders goal in this place. We are looking to see this body perfected like Christ. We are straining for everyone in this place to continually be transformed and reach the transformation that God desires for your life. That is why we labor. That is why we strive. That is why we preach. That is why we rub together our shoulders. That is why we strive for unity. Because it's only through that unity that the transformation will occur. Guys, this is exactly what Jesus was teaching about when he was speaking to his disciples in Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen. Wow. Jesus called us to shoulder one load, one singular load, his yoke. It's not multiple. It's one. It takes all of us taking that one yoke upon us, putting our collective shoulder into it to be able to carry that yoke. Guys, our unity is what makes the load that he has for us to carry a joy and a delight. Amen. Without the unity, that load is not a joy and a delight. No, disunity actually is the very thing that makes his yoke a wearisome, burdensome task to us. Unity fixes that problem immediately. I don't care if you're talking about the transformation on Mount Ebal or the blessings found on Mer Mount Gerizim. Guys, when you're looking at Mount Gerizim and you're looking at the blessings of God, listen to this. Even his blessings become dreadful burdens for us when we are not unified together with Shechem Echad. Even his blessings, all of a sudden, you walk with them for a little bit, and then they're burdensome. Oh, man, he blessed me with this task, but now it's just a burden to me. Now it just feels heavy, like, oh, what a drag. I, I really wanted to use my time in a different kind of way. Guys, bearing his yoke for this body requires unity. And with unity, that's what happens when Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It takes unity to be able to feel that kind of yoke on our shoulders together. Yeah, so what, what is it that prevents us from having our lips purified, as Zephaniah 3.9 says? What is it that prevents us from having pure speech come out of our mouth? What is it that prevents us from having Shechem Ichad? One shoulder under one burden, that is the yoke of Jesus Christ. James 4.1 puts it this way. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is it not the source, your pleasures, that wage war in your members? Now, we usually read this as in what's going on inside of us, right? What's going on inside of our minds, ourselves personally, and on an individual basis. But we are preaching about Shechem Ichad. So what about what's going on inside the members of this one body? We're carrying one burden. We are meant to do this together as one. That means we have to be looking and seeing, are we in step with one another? So the view of this passage, this passage 
is the same way. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among the body of Christ? Is it not the source of your pleasures that wage war in the members of the body of Christ? Guys, we have to wrestle with this. We have to engage with this because it's what's going on inside of us, and it's what is uh, our own ambitions that are keeping us from walking shoulder to shoulder, that are keeping us from having pure lips that speak the word of God in the right time when he wants us to. Ooh, church, listen up. Nothing kills Shechem Ichad mm. faster than running away from the yoke and the unity that you were designed to carry in trading that yoke for pleasure instead. Wow. Nothing kills our unity together faster than that. Now, we're going to zoom in on this for a second because we've got a specific example, and it's one of many, but it's one that's been present in our homes this week. Yeah. It's one that's been present in our teams this week. It's one that's been present all around us. So let's dig into it together. Are you guys ready to grow? Yeah. Okay. We're not talking about married pleasures, okay? That's not on the table. No, that Red and Gabby are going to have that in a couple of days, and that's holy, good, and pleasing to God, okay? No, we're talking about those evenings. Maybe when you would just rather not carry the yoke of the body of Christ on your shoulder. So you lock yourself in your room prematurely. You, you get back. You indulge yourself in some worldly pleasures that you think that you want more than the unity the Shechem Ichad, that could be yours in Christ Jesus. That's the kind of thing that we're getting at when we say running away from the yoke. And that's not too difficult to think about it if we actually stop and take the time. How, mu how many times are we finishing a work day and all we want to do is recluse to our room? All we want to do is what our flesh is wanting to do rather than we know what we know we must do in order to build up that unity that God desires in us. Man, you remember that one of our main directives this year was increased communion with one another? Y'all remember that? Guys, we are growing. We are the body building up the body. It is not about any one of us outshining another. We are doing this with one shoulder. The only way that you see the increase that the Lord spoke over us is to stop running away from the yoke. Guys, it is easy when we do it together. And not easy in the sense of, oh, I'm just going to go along to get along. It's easy because it's a delight. It's a joy. It's something that we get to rejoice in. Guys, it's not burdensome. So we need to start assembling as one man beneath it and learning to shoulder it together. You know what that means? Every time that we do this, we know exactly how to fit into one another. Now, Pastor Nick's slightly taller than me, so sometimes I'm going to get underneath his shoulder. Sometimes I'll be able to stand up a little taller. But every time, the more and more that we're doing this, the more unified and more tightly knit we're being fit together. Aren't you glad that we're bringing this up tonight? Yeah! Come on. It's good to dwell in Shechem and have Eureka moments, isn't it? Yeah. Guys, is it good to have Eureka moments? Yeah. Come on. Somebody say that with me. Eureka! Eureka! Amen. We are making the connection between these concepts for you because we saw something special in the Paleo-Hebrew for the word Shechem. It's made up of three letters, a Shin, a Kaf, and a Mem. So as you can see on the slide here, you can break that down into a sharp pressing that bends your chaos so that you will become mighty. Guys, is that revelatory or what? A sharp pressing that bends our chaos so that we can actually walk as one mighty body. Dwelling in Shechem is the very method that God will use so that our own chaos can be bent under his yoke and we can collectively shoulder the load like he always intended us to carry. Guys, family, our fleshly pleasures need to be pressed because they contribute to the very chaos that prevents us from becoming mighty. And praise God, brother. Praise God for that very pressing. Praise God that we're not only finding areas just like this, we're learning to love their exposure. Yes. We're learning to love the process. That's because these areas are not a reset. Oh, we're not resetting every time that God reveals something like this. No, they're opportunities to renew our covenant with the Lord to renew the love of repentance that we had at first, Amen. to show him that we still have the love that we had at first for his transformation in our lives. Yeah. 
Amen. Man, we're joyfully rushing into the process of transformation for the sake of becoming more like our king and learning to shoulder more of the load that he's trying to put on this body. Amen. So tonight, we want to declare to you, we, we are, are not, not ashamed. ashamed. This is the title of our message this evening. We're not ashamed. So we want to jump right into the meat of our message with you tonight. We have four major stakes. That is a tomahawk, a filet, a ribeye, and of course, a New York strip. Look, guys, this is what the Lord is wanting to reveal to us. So we have something to chew on. Right now, we need to give you the right perspective of the word ashamed. So let's put this next slide up on the screen. Okay. This is a simple Google uh, search of the word ashamed. Embarrassed or guilty because of one's actions, characteristics, or associ associations. Look down at the similar words down at the bottom. Reluctant, loathe, unwilling, disinclined, hesitant, indisposed, or slow. Guys, being ashamed is so much more than just an embarrassment or feeling guilty. It actually produces other actions that usually have to do with fear. Being reluctant. Being loathsome. Being unwilling to do the will of God. Being disinclined. Being hesitant, indisposed, or slow. If Jesus can scorn the shame that was trying to grab a hold of him because of the cross, like it says in Hebrews 12 too, church, we can scorn the shame that wants to grab hold of us as well. Guys, look at those words. When you think of a shame, do you think of that? No. But that, that lays it out pretty clear about what our obedience should look like and what we are in opposition to. These seven results of you operating in shame must go tonight. And they will, they, they will as you eat the steaks that we've cooked up for you this evening. Guys, we want to make it clear before we get into our first steak together. These bottom seven... They are the product of dwelling in shame. This is what happens when you're full of shame. It's important for you to notice. That's important for you to grab hold of before we get to these stakes because a lot of times when I'm hesitant about something, when I'm insecure about a decision, I don't usually think that the root might be that I'm full of shame. I don't usually think that because I'm ashamed, I am slow to act and slow to move. That that might be an option. It doesn't. It's not the first thing that pops into my mind. I don't think that because I'm ashamed, I am, oh man, I just, I don't feel the zeal of God like I, I need to today. Like I know that I should. I'm called to be a zealous man. Right, Carlos? Yeah. Called to be zealous for God's name. But I'm feeling reluctant for righteousness today. What, what is going on? Maybe I just need to pray a little bit more. Or maybe you have a shame problem. Maybe that's it. So what we're going to do is we're going to get into four stakes. We're going to cut them up. We're going to eat them together tonight. They're going to be delicious. They're cooked medium rare. They're incredible. The first steak that we are going to get into is there is no shame in his name. There is no shame in his name. I'm going to read Exodus 33, starting in verse 16 for you. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Family, the discourse between God and Moses in this passage should excite everybody in the room. The fact that a man, Moses, can have this kind of conversation with the God of all creation, that should excite everybody in this room. Guys, every time that you see that phrase, found favor, 
it is the same word for grace. It is that, it is, the Hebrew word is hen, and it is translated as grace. So keep that in mind as we continue on. Verse 13 starts off with, if I have found favor, and the phrase continues on several times. The point is that God initiated the process with Moses. God is the one who initiated it. And, he, and Moses is saying, if I have found favor, if I have found favor. And the Lord is saying, you have found favor. Yeah. It is why I've been with you this whole time. I'm the one who called you out by name. I do know you by name. Not only that, I'm going to reveal my name yeah. to you. Can you see that symbiotic relationship there? Guys, it is for his namesake that we've been called. Can you, can you think back on some times that you may have been ashamed that you're called by the name of God? I mean, be real. We're going to just sit here for a minute. How often are we, think, are we quick to call God to task and say, oh, if I have found favor with you, and in actuality, it's because we're slow, we're hesitant, we're reluctant because we're ashamed. And so we start making up these excuses and trying to call God to task as if he's not the one who called us and told us already what to do. So what's amazing about this interaction is the mutual relationship of God knowing Moses by name and the fact that he is revealing his name to him. God was willing to make himself known to Moses. He passed before him and showed him his glory. This is what God has been expressing to the depth of our hearts. This is what he wants us to see. Church, you have found favor with God. He has revealed his name to you because he knows each one of you by name. He is supplying us with grace the same way he did Moses and the same way that Peter admonishes us in the first epistle in 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter 4 verse 15 says this. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any kind of criminal, or even, even as a meddler. Now, we were reading this earlier, and we thought, well, that's interesting. I would never have put meddler in that passage. That, that seems kind of funny. But it's interesting because although it seems like it doesn't go, meddler would actually be the Nabal version on the side of the card. But there's an Abigail version that correlates to that. It's not meddler. That would be the negative trait. Guys, your meddling has turned into the Abigail trait of genuine concern for the welfare of your brothers. That's the other side of the card. And we're here to tell you tonight that you have put these ways behind you. Your meddling has become an Abigail trait of genuine concern for one another. Amen. Like, like genuine, I, am, I, I have concern over my brother Cho back there. That brother right there is walking with the Lord, and I am so proud of what he's becoming. The, the Abigail trait is coming alive in each one of us, and it is causing our unity to grow. 16, however, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed. Do not be ashamed. Even suffering for the name, there's a temptation for shame to creep in there, and you might not even know that it's there. But praise God that you bear that name. Amen. You know what Pastor Matt always says? says praise pulls you out. Yeah, this verse is proof of that. On, when you man. begin to praise his name, it pulls you right out of the shame that you didn't even know existed. 17, for it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? We bear the name of Christ and the name of our Father, the Lord. For this reason, our judgment is not some ominous event waiting for us in the future. There's no shame or dread in it. It's not a future event. No, we're being judged and judging ourselves right now. Amen. And we're being transformed through it. We are on a pathway toward perfection. This is every reason for us to stand up in confidence. Church, we're not ashamed of his name. We have his name upon us, and because of that, his transformation process is working in us. Guys, John 17 talks about Jesus manifesting his name to his disciples, and he continues to go on that he will continue to manifest. That is, make God the Father's name known 
to his disciples. That is what he's doing inside of us. There's no shame there. He selected us. He picked us. He chose us, and he's choosing to reveal his name. We are marked as sons by his name. Guys, the reason why we need to grab hold of that is because the moment that we can bring that to mind and we can cry out for the Spirit to help us remember, that keeps us from being reluctant in obedience. That keeps us from being hesitant to take a step because we know whose name we represent. It's not our own. Guys, we are hearing this over and over again. God has given us a new name. He wants us to walk in that name. Come on, brother. Right, you know about giving out a name. Come on. Gabby, you're going to walk in a new name. Yeah. So as we move on, we're going to move on to our second stake. Y'all remember what that was? That's, that's the filet mignon. This second stake is, there's no shame in his word. As we talk about this, let's go to Exodus chapter 4 and verse 11. The Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight? Or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. How pashat does it get, guys? The Lord is telling us, I can shut your mouth right now if I want to. I'm telling you to open it up. I'm going to fill your mouth with my words. I'm going to teach you what to say. Go and speak my word. Don't be ashamed of it. Guys, the point that God makes here to Moses is profound if we look at it rightly. He's telling him, I gave you your ears. You're hearing correctly. I'm telling you to go. I gave you your mouth. You are speaking my words. There is nothing to be ashamed of. The mouth is given by God. The ears are given by God. The eyes to see rightly are all given by God. Can you see how he's helping Moses along? He's telling him, you lack absolutely nothing. Church, we lack absolutely nothing. Everything that we have to speak his word boldly and unashamedly, he's given to us. So have you been given a mouth? Have you been given ears to hear? As we're not just talking about the physical, we're talking about how we have inclined our heart. You remember one of those negative traits of ashamed was disinclined? No, the Lord is causing our hearts to be inclined to him. He wants us to hear his word and he wants us to speak it boldly. Look, there's no excuse that we can come up with to trump the fact that we are created by him and he wants to speak through us. He can speak to any one of us at any time, and yet he speaks to this whole body through one person. He speaks to this whole body collectively through multiple people. He wants us to be unified and unashamed of his word. Church, we've been given the very words of life. Let that sink in. They're not idle words. They are our very life. This is what we live by. This is what we cling to. Let's not forget what our hearts are inclined to. It is his word. Think on the revelations that have been given to us week in and week out. As they're talking about steak, there's so much to chew on. (laughs) Oftentimes, we're leaving stuff on the plate. No, we need to be speaking exactly what God has given to us. We need to let it manifest inside of us. We can't be unwilling to apply his word in our life. You know, when you're reading through those 12 gates, how many of you, I want to see your hands, how many of you struggle with seeing yourself in that way? That would be an example of the manifestation of shame that we're talking about here. As what we are preaching to you tonight is that there is no shame in the word of God. There is no shame for us encountering the word of God. There is no shame about what the word of God speaks about us. Yeah, something's happening here. I can feel that. Come on. It's not just about mimicking these words about who you are. It's not just about memorizing the 12 gates. It's about praying. And if you don't feel like this is who you are, if you feel shame because you are not measuring up to what God said that you are, then you pray and you approach his throne and you ask him for more grace to transform you. You ask him for more power over your sin. You ask him, Lord, you are a good God. I'm not ashamed that your name is upon me. I carry it with pride, but your word, I I, I feel like I'm not measuring up to what it says about me. Give me more grace. 
Give me more power to see myself as you see me. Guys, that will change a man. That will change a person in this room tonight. 2 Corinthians 4.1 Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry. Oh my goodness gracious. We do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. It's through God's mercy that we have this ministry. You know what that means? It means that your spot in this church and in this ministry has nothing to do with your so-called acceptance or not acceptance of it. It depends on God's mercy in your life. He opened up the spot. He put your foot in the spot. He told you to stand there. He's teaching you how to be equipped in it. He's raising you up. He's the one that brought you here. It depends on his mercy. Not on the shame that you carry around. Don't you forget that. You have renounced secret and shameful ways, deception, distortions of every kind. Guys, we can see that your lives are becoming even more transparent. An open book that can be changed by the very word of God. And that plays a crucial role in the transformation in others through the plain truth that comes from his word. Notice what this scripture is opposing. It's opposing the, I'm going to choose this and not that. I'm going to believe this portion and not that portion. Guys, he's given us a full meal to eat. He's given us a whole filet mignon to sink our teeth in. And that is the word of God. We leave no room for reluctance or hesitance in obeying what God's word is actually saying to us. We submit to being ichad with the word and the spirit of God. Church, we are not ashamed of his word and what it has to say about you. Paul, do you have something to say here? I do. Yeah. I'm learning to submit to the Spirit. I'm learning that I want to be ichad with the Spirit and the Word of God. And I know that each one of you are fighting for that in your own life. You know when it's difficult for me? It's when I see my wife. She's having a difficult time, and I know what the Word says. And I know what she's wanting from me in that moment is sympathy. And I know it's difficult. If I'm slow to speak His Word exactly what his word says and not just speak it i don't want to just uh, have something memorized and then just spit it out there i want to have it manifest inside of me i want her to see that so that she can believe i want her to grow in her faith and confidence and say i'm not ashamed of what the word says either i'm not going to be slow to put my flesh to death right now because i can see it in my husband i can see him living this out men this should cause us to rise up in this place We are learning to submit to the spirit and the word at work inside of us. Church, we're not ashamed of his word. We're not going to let the effectiveness of God's word hit a dull heart. We're going to have hearts that are inclined to him. We're going to have a mouth ready to speak the very word that his spirit is prompting us to speak in that moment. That means we're not going to be ashamed of the corrections and the discipline that comes. Yeah. You know, every time we talk about it, we all are like, yes, I love correction. I love discipline. Wait, it's still a soft spot in each one of us. We're gonna get it. It's still something that we have to learn to grow in and say, I'm not ashamed of that. I'm not going to be reluctant or hesitant to respond to that correction. I'm going to love it. I'm not ashamed of God's word in my life. Guys, we're moving into our third stake. Y'all ready for it? It's that tomahawk. There is no shame in his work. Come on, say that with me. There is no shame shame. in his work. work. Let's go to Nehemiah chapter 4, and we're going to pick up in verse 4. Oh, you know it, Adam. Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight. For they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. Guys, right here, I want to just pause for a minute. Because when we start feeling that uh, despising, when we start to feel and hear those insults, and we, t- we start to feel that opposition, 
there's something that wants to shrink back inside of us. We're saying no more. We're not ashamed of the work that God has put in our hand. Look at verse 6. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height. All these things are happening. We can feel the despising and the insults. So we rebuilt the wall. We didn't stop the work. And it wasn't just Pastor Nick was building up his part of the wall. And, and Gabriel's building up his part of the wall. But I'm sitting here shrinking back watching them. No. We are shouldering this load together. The wall was built up to half its height as one. Yeah. One wall. The whole thing. That sound familiar? Y'all heard that before? Yeah. Guys, this is what it looks like. We're not ashamed of the work that God has given us. All the people worked with all their heart. Guys, this, this is no reluctance, no hesitancy. We're giving everything that we have to the labor. We need the heart of the people of Nehemiah's day. They're just coming out of captivity, right? What do they have? They're going back to a broken down city. They're going back to a p pile of rubble. But they worked with all of their heart, and they did it as one man. These Israelites were fresh out of captivity, but they had willing hearts to get to work. We have to have that willingness inside of us, not disheartened by insults. And you know what those insults look like. Oh, that's the way that you want to live your life? That's the pattern? That's the way of life that you choose? Not ashamed, brother. No, we're not ashamed in the least bit. Guys, reverse validation comes in the form of the world despising the work of God that you've been taxed with. You can know for certain that what God has given you is going to cause the world to despise you. They're going to cast insults on you. And that's reverse validation. That means we're going to rebuild and we're going to work with one heart. Insults, ridicule, and mocking will always be there for the man and woman that is doing the work of God. Church, do not be ashamed. Our good father has given us work to do, and him alone do we seek to please. Did y'all catch in verse 6? That all of the wall was reaching until half its height. It grew up as one. Church, when we work for the kingdom, we work with one shoulder. Shechem Ichad, growing up as one man. Oh, come on. Turn with us to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. You're going to want to be here with us for this one. Oh, yeah. We're going to read from the ESV. For by grace you have been saved through faith, or you are being saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. Man, what a revelation that is. It is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship. Come on. Somebody say, I am God's workmanship. I am God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So when we read this verse, when we talked about not being ashamed of his work, you immediately thought about what you're doing for him, what you've done for him, what you're going to do for him. Oh, no, I'm not, I'm not ashamed of that. But the scripture says here that we are his workmanship. That means that there is no shame in the work that he is doing in you. That's what we're trying to say tonight. You should not be ashamed at the work that he is doing in you. Can I get an amen, Cody? Amen. You should not be ashamed at the work that God is accomplishing in you. As it's, you're his workmanship. You're the work of his hands. You are the clay in his hands. You are what is being formed by him. When you're carrying around shame because of the work that he's doing in your life, what does that tell the potter. That's not good, right? You are his workmanship. You are his pride and joy. You are the very thing that he has put his hands on and he is forming and making. Guys, I promise you, it might not feel glorious, but it is, you are being made into something glorious by his hands. It's his workmanship that equips you for the good works that you're to do for him. It's the way that he forms you that actually makes you to be able to do the works that, that he has prepared in advance for you to do. The Lord has chosen to use you, and you should have incredible security in that. As our works are definitely meaningless when they're outside of God's assignment. 
But what an immense confidence there is in walking wholeheartedly in the will of God and learning to accomplish His works in our life. We have a reality check for you at this time. If the works are prepared beforehand, what in the world did you have to do with their choosing anyway? No, God, God chose them before the creation of the world. He chose them before you were even formed, before you were made, before you were anything, before you existed at all. He had your works chosen for you, and he had the plan of workmanship in what he was going to make you into. Is that comforting to anybody in this room? You are his workmanship, a workman who does not need to be ashamed at what is happening in your life and the tools that he's equipping you with that he will equip you with to accomplish his works. Church say, we're not ashamed of his work. We're not ashamed of his work. This is what we've been hearing. This is why we can say, yeah, I can go up to Mount Ebal. I can lay this on the altar again. I can look ahead at what God has intended for me on Mount Gerizim, the blessings that are before me. I'm not ashamed of the work that's happening inside of me because I know where he's taking me to. I know that he's the one who's chosen me for this. I know that he's the one who has given me everything I need to accomplish the work. We've got to grow in that confidence tonight. That is what helps us to say, I'm not ashamed of the work. I know what he's doing. I know where he's taking me to. I know that this was well before I was even created, well before the world was even created. He had a plan for you. Guys, that's something that we can say, I'm unashamed about that. I'm going to do the work that God has for me. As we're moving on to our fourth stake tonight, in this part of the message, we're talking about no shame in his family. Are you my family? I love my family. Pastor Wade, I love my church. This is a beautiful church. I have no shame in this family. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 2, and we're going to pick up in verse 11. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call him them brothers and sisters. Okay, hop down to verse 16. Instead, they were longing for a better, better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Okay, guys. So this morning, my wife and I had some stern words with one another. Like this morning, before I left for work. It was over a standard that we had set in our house that was not being carried out. And there were some stern words. It was a tough conversation. There was brazenness involved in it. But do her actions or my sternness toward them mean that I am now ashamed to call her my wife? I need a better no from you. No! Of course they don't. Of course they don't mean that I'm now ashamed to call my beautiful wife my wife. That's not how this works, guys. She is still being made holy, just like I am being made holy. We are of the same family. I have chosen her. Her spot with me is more secure than it has ever been, and it's not going anywhere. I handpicked her to be a part of my family. There is no shame in that. That actually provides the opportunity for us to have stern conversations and for us to grow. Guys, put yourself in that spot with God. I want you to think about you being the bride for a second. He gave you that spot. He cleared it out for you. He called you by name. He declared, you are mine. You belong to me. Because you made a mistake, because you sinned, because something happened on a temporary basis, you're going to carry that kind of shame around with you? We put our foot down tonight and we say no in the name of Jesus. That's not how a godly husband acts. That's not how our father acts. Guys, get that. I need you to get that with us tonight. We've experienced some of the sternness of God. It has been for our benefit. Oh, we're actually learning to love it. And Jesus still says to us, I am not ashamed to call you my brother. I am not ashamed to call you my sister. 
Adonai still says to us, I am not ashamed to, for you to call me your God. Church, we also want to declare tonight, we're not ashamed of you at all. On. Not one of you in this room. I'm looking around from left to right. Not one of you are we ashamed of at all. No, we're a brotherhood. We're called by God. Your position here has been God-ordained. Man, it's time to lift up your head and stop being shameful about it. You know why we're not ashamed of you? Because we can see the evidence of God working in your lives. We can see that He is not ashamed of you. So church, we're not ashamed of you. We can see your excitement about the kingdom and the future growing because you can see His grace in your life is actually at work and it's growing every single day. His grace, His power over sin is alive and at work inside of you. You can be certain that His grace is at work in your life because of verses like Romans chapter 6 and verse 5. For if we have been united with Him in, like in His death, we will certainly also be united with Him in His resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with Him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Guys, you can be certain tonight, certain that His grace is at work in your life. Because your unity with your leadership and your unity with your brothers is growing. Is that true in your life? Yeah. Then you can be certain that His grace is growing right alongside of that unity because they are not mutually exclusive. No, they must go together. Amen. Guys, one of the glorious things about being united together with Him in His death is that no matter what situation you find yourself in, no matter whose fault things might have been, no matter how you are actually feeling in those moments, you cannot be wronged. Say, I cannot be wronged. I cannot be wrong. Say, I cannot be hurt by it. I cannot be hurt by it. Church, you can't be any of these things because the old self that would do that it's already been crucified with Christ. So sorry, too bad. I can't be wronged by this situation. I can't be hurt by this situation. I don't care whose fault. It might have felt like it was. I can't be wronged by this because I've already been crucified in the grave with Christ. Amen. And I'm resurrected into something brand new. Guys, you are growing in this unifying way of life because of the way that you are learning to stand under one shoulder with all of us in this crucifixion. Amen. Therefore, you can be certain that you will also stand shoulder to shoulder with him and with all of us in his resurrection. Oh, you are so right, my brother. His grace is seen best in the ways that our interactions with one another are growing into a real brotherhood. Y'all want to see something deep? Yeah. Something revelatory? Yeah. Lord, God, the Lord has been helping us all along and he ain't stopping now. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 11. We're going to pick up in verse 12. It says, he will raise a banner for the nations and gather the exiles of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four corners, from the four quarters of the earth. Guys, there will be a banner raised. Like Isaiah 8, we are becoming signs and symbols from the Lord Almighty. He will be faithful to continue to bring those sharp pressings meant to bend our chaos so that you will become mighty. Look at verse 13. Ephraim's jealousy will vanish. Judah's enemies will be cut off. Ephraim will not be jealous of Judah, nor Judah hostile toward Ephraim. Woo! This verse is the right dealing with Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. Yeah. The broadening of our shoulders, the carrying of our collective load. As this verse is saying that right here and now, hostilities toward one another, these are getting the hell out of here. Amen. The hostilities that Judah and Ephraim had in this passage, as we were reading this, this is, this is absolutely prophetic for our time right here and right now. Yep. Lifelong jealousies of one another, they're getting crushed because your position is secure in Christ. Your position is secure in this body. And the potter is going to make you and do exactly what he wants you to be. 
have security in that. There is no shame in being created into what he destined for you to be before the creation of the world. That's actually glory. That's actually glory for his name. Guys, our diligence to spend time together, the directive that we have this year, this is the very thing that as it increases, as we get the revelation, then these jealousies and these hostilities are able to come forward and they're able to be crushed. They're able to be dealt with rightly. It is our shoulder to shoulder, our rubbing shoulders together, our getting under the one yoke and one load of Jesus Christ that's actually exposing these glorious things. And they're glorious because they are getting crushed in you. And we can see it. He will be faithful to continue to bring these things into our life. And joy and delight will be the result in us through the process. Yeah, but those aren't the only results of our efforts. Let's keep moving down to verse 14. They will swoop down on the slopes of Philistia to the west. Together, they will plunder the people of the east. They will lay hands on Edom and Moab. Yeah. And the Ammonites will be subject to them. Yeah. You hear the unity there? Yeah. Guys, we didn't, even, we didn't even really have to connect the dots for you with this verse because a good Jew named Rashi did it for us. <laughs> so listen to what it says, what he says about Isaiah 11, 14. He says, And they shall fly of one accord against the Philistines in the west. Israel will fly and run of one accord against the Philistines who are in the west of Eretz, Israel, and conquer their land. This literally says a shoulder and, it, and is used in this case to denote unity. Yeah. It's Shechem Ichad. Compare this to Zephaniah 3 9. This is what Rashi said. It's one accord. It's Shechem Ichad. It's one shoulder. This has been rendered, and they shall join in one accord to smite the Philistines who are in the West. We will have unity under one shoulder, resulting in victory over God's enemies. Guys, this is what it looks like. This is how God is taking us from glory to glory. As we are faithful to crush those jealousies, crush that hostility, let God do his work in us and know that we are all called by his name as one family. Guys, we are swooping down on the enemies of God. We're taking plunder from the fierce like Isaiah 49 promises us. And a rich storehouse of revelation and an indestructible inheritance for our children who will be saved through the example that we set right here and right now. So we're approaching a close with you tonight, but we have some seriously encouraging and revelatory things to say as we do. We you guys still with us tonight? Oh yeah! You're going to want to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. We'll be reading this from the ESV. As you get there, say, we are not ashamed. We are not ashamed. So do not... Be ashamed to testify about our Lord. Come on. Ooh, almost like we are not ashamed of his name. Or ashamed of me as prisoner. Oh, uh, we're not ashamed of his word either. But join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Yeah, we're not ashamed of his work either. Amen. Who has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we have done. There it is again, just like Ephesians chapter 2. But because of his own purpose and grace. Yeah, that's right. He purposed your place here. And he purposed your grace to work mightily, his grace to work mightily inside of you. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Come on. Oh my goodness gracious. Is your confidence rising tonight? Yeah. We're not ashamed of his family. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. Guys, you might not know this, but there has actually been a great deal of debate over how 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12 is translated. Paul has a slide for you. Yeah, this is our last slide for the night. Pay attention. 
In the NIV, it says, he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. In the ESV, what we just read, he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. In the Amplified, he is able to guard and keep that which has been entrusted to me and which I have committed to him until that day. So which one is it? Is he guarding what we are entrusting to him? Or is he guarding what he has entrusted to us? Y'all know the answer. You answered already. Yes. So. Yeah, go ahead, Paul. We've got some important questions for you this evening. Yeah, we, we need your responses when we ask these questions. So think about what he's saying and respond back to him. Have you entrusted your life to him, church? Yes. Have you entrusted your family to him? Yes. Have you entrusted your future to him? Yes. Have you entrusted your inheritance to him? Yes. There is no shame for you because he is able to guard what you have entrusted to him. Let's take the flip side of this for a second. Mm. Has he entrusted you with his name, church? Yes. Has he entrusted you with his word? Yes. Has he entrusted you with his work? Yes. Has he entrusted you with his family? Yes. yes. Then there is no shame for you because he chose to put his name, his reputation, his body of work upon you and upon us. It was his decision to do so. Amen. And he is able to guard that name and reputation that he has entrusted to you. Amen. Church, you are not ashamed because you know him in who you believe. You know that he's what he's entrusted you with and you know that his grace is working in you. You have every confidence, church, in the heavens and on the earth to approach this altar with confidence tonight. Our final passage comes from Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Guys, all the way back to Moses, we're being reminded you have found favor. You have found grace with me. You have everything that you need. Remember, it's disunity that makes his yoke weary, a wearisome task. And every one of us have some leftovers of this in us that need to be dealt with. That's a joyous thing. Because we're having a eureka moment right here and right now. As with that being said, stand up with us. We've got a very specific goal tonight. We're going to help you out with it. If you haven't noticed, we've been working on something for the past couple weeks together. We've been working on learning to approach the bronze altar with joy. You guys been working on that with us? Yeah, it's actually been a very, very revelatory and joyous time together. This shows the Lord that we're not ashamed. When we can approach the bronze altar with joy, with confidence, with courage, knowing what he will accomplish in us, as this is the very thing that shows him, God, I'm not ashamed of your name on me. I'm not ashamed of your word. I'm not ashamed of the family or the work that you've placed around me. I'm not ashamed of you. That's that is what we convey to God when we approach his altar in that way. Let your choice of a joyful approach right now overflow. What we're going to do as we approach this altar is we are going to ask the Lord for the measure of his grace that we need tonight. He's apportioned it for us since the creation of the world. It belongs to you. So it's time to ask him for what you need. It's time to ask him for that grace that he has already set aside for you and for me. Grace to help you stop running away from his yoke. 
grace that causes you to turn back around and to plunge into the weight of the load. Grace that says, I am going to stand shoulder to shoulder. I am going to stand ichad shechem with my brothers. Grace that empowers you to rush in and put on that yoke and burden squarely on your shoulders tonight. Grace that brings you into a greater unity together with this body. Everyone right now, put a big old smile on your face. I, I guarantee you that starting right now, this is not going to be wearisome. Come on, approach the altar and raise your hands. Father, we thank you for apportioning your grace to us, mighty God. Lord, we thank you that it belongs to us. You say, ask and receive. Lord, you haven't received because we haven't asked you yet. Well, right now, tonight, Lord, we approach your altar and we ask, Lord. We ask for your grace, Father. Show us your mercy tonight, mighty God. Help us to shoulder the load together, Lord God. Help us to be in unity with our brothers.